the top here. And he has been, and he is still uh, in the membership of many academic uh, societies, especially in bioethics and ethics societies. And he is in many editorial board members of many bioethics journals. He is now the president of the American University of Sovereign Nations. And today, he will give us a talk about traditions of informed choice, about a good test around the world. Professor Major, please. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to be back in this room and uh, to meet many new friends and our dear colleagues. I wish to thank uh, for the kind introduction uh, uh, from the honorable chair. Um, so the topic today, I want to talk about traditions of informed choice about a good day around the world. Um, so I hope that uh, we are going to enjoy our week in Taiwan. Uh, from the talk we've just heard, it certainly sounds like a good place to die. But uh, please, uh, we don't want anyone to have a death here. But preparation for death is part of our life. And uh, it's critical that we have this. Bioethics is a bridge between different people and peoples. Uh, if this is our path, of life towards death. Uh, is your vision across the other end of the bridge clear? And how much anxiety is there to cross this bridge? If we establish a fair and equitable process where people can experience the last stages of life more clearly, then there will be less anxiety. And uh, this is uh, one of the I think, humane and ethical obligations of good government is to establish a system where people uh, can have their health. And uh, we know uh, there is one certain thing in your life, don't we? This, this is the only certain thing in your life, uh, death. And preparing a path that allows us, if we need, to have palliative care uh, will be fair and equitable. Confucius uh, said that to love a thing means wanting it to live. So what happens when we can live no more? Does our whole system of ethics fall down? How does our philosophy prepare us for uh, the end of life. Uh, another sage, Mahatma uh, Gandhi, said, love is the strongest force the world possesses, and yet it's the humblest imaginable. The more efficient the force is, the more silent and subtle it is. Love is the subtlest force in the world. And we saw in the previous presentation, uh, love was mentioned several times as well. Humane care, uh, in fact, it was the name of a journal that uh, existed about 20 years ago talking about palliative care. Uh, love. So that is, uh, I think, uh, an essence of our ethics. The evolution of the concept of patient autonomy is seen in the trend that's reflected in all cultures moving from paternalistic compassion and love towards informed decision making. Traditional ideas have undergone rapid change for globalization, itself driven by the communication devices that are driving a resurgence in individualism around the world. Uh, by the way, already the first photograph from the bus is on Facebook. Uh, you can tag yourself. But even this process, uh, we have people uh, on social media sharing their experience with their dear friends, and with others around the world to witness what is happening and the successes and failures of systems. 
to what was at once a private affair, for some people becomes a very public affair. The situation is more difficult than simply claiming that in the past patients did not have autonomy and that physicians always acted paternalistically. The sick may prefer to leave the decisions up to others or use subtle linguistic expressions to convey their will. However, in many places there's still a hierarchical social system that makes it difficult for patients and doctors to be truly at an equal level in their relationship. And so if we look at this uh, picture as to which model of a relationship do you have, um, let's take a visit to the doctor to seek treatment. Is it a paternalistic model, uh, a doctor above a patient? Is it informed consent, where they're meant to be a similar level, or informed choice, a patient above the doctor? And as a contrast, let's think about a visit to the supermarket to buy food. A visit to the supermarket. Uh, when I first went, for example, to Berlin uh, in East Germany, at that time it was quite paternalistic. The supplies were very limited in the 1980s. Uh, you could only enter uh, if you had a uh, you had to have a shopping cart. You could buy certain goods at very cheap price. Uh, I went as a student, so it was very good coming as a student. You could buy extremely cheap bread and milk uh, and uh, travel uh, in East Germany. On the other hand, you didn't have the choice that we think uh, so much about now. Uh, if you uh, had a chance to walk around the city we were first in yesterday, uh, there were so many shops, so many shops was open on Sunday. Do you know that when I grew up in New Zealand, there were no shops open on Saturday and Sunday. And still today in Germany, uh, maybe no shops are open on <coughs> Sundays. And only on Saturday mornings, every second Saturday, for example. Uh, yet you'll find maybe in Asia, there are shops open all the time. Yes? And there are the informal sector, uh, the night markets and so on become very uh, symbolic of what could be said to be choice. So you have a, a choice here. Do we have a choice in drugs? Drugs for the end of life care. Drugs for treatment of disease. Traditional medicines. We have choice. And we've had choice for such a long time. Now there is a transition from a paternalism through informed consent to informed choice uh, occurring. Uh, whether uh, that's informed or not is actually another question, but it is a, certainly a progression. The concept of informed choice is seen where the patient becomes a consumer of medicine. And it's seen in pharmacy stores, uh, but not in the medical consultation. Uh, in the same country, we may see paternalism in, in medical consultation, but choice in buying drugs, smoking, taking risks, eating unhealthy food to make us sick. So you can do anything you like, uh, but maybe at the medical consultation level, it's a uh, controlled situation and less choice. Freedom of expression is a principle of ethics as is enshrined in human rights. And in the Article 19 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it upholds the freedom to hold opinions without interference. Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of the Human Genome and Human Rights says states should also moderate undertake to facilitate on the subject an open international discussion, ensuring a free expression of various social, cultural, religious, and philosophical opinions. So we have enshrined in human rights literature, uh, the freedom to hold opinions, the freedom of thought, it's critical as a basic human right. The freedom of how we should die uh, is an extension of this. We have exercised the freedom of choice if we had a choice where to live. So this, uh, for example, is a public health uh, example from Japan. Uh, a tsunami warning stone. 
There are about 300 of them left in Japan. And they say uh, a big wave came, many people died, so do not build below the stone. It's on the side of a hill where the tsunami comes. And if in northeastern Japan, every 60 to 80 years, there is a large tsunami. Uh, we're talking of a 15-meter uh, tsunami, which would be higher than this building. High, I mean, higher than this room. We're on the second floor, uh, for example. But what people do is they often forget this, and they, they think it's very convenient to build in the valley next to the ocean because it saves walking up a hill. Uh, and yet, 60 years later, you're going to be washed away, and if you can't run up the hill uh, quickly, uh, when you have an earthquake, um, you're going to die. So knowledge of the protection, the wisdom of the past. So there has been examples of choice. Um, many sick persons are afraid to be a bother or burden to others, so they attempt to avoid trouble that could occur if they clearly express the will and differed from that of others. Medical ethics is changing everywhere with the balance between technology and humanism. A diversity of views is found in all societies despite some examples and trends discussed here. Now, there are examples that you don't want to bother people. This is still a common feeling. I don't want to bother my family financially. It's a very important question, Jockey asked. Because if most of the medical expenses of your entire life will be spent in the last month of your life, and you want, you worked really hard to save money for your family's future and your children's future and grandchildren, then how can you avoid to pay this money if you have a very kind national health service as you do here? Then the government supports your previous tax paying and supports you. But many countries in the world do not. You may have to, if someone gets sick in the house, you're going to have to sell the house. Yet, ironically, those family members probably earned all their money to give a house to their family so they didn't need to worry in the future. Yet, it's crazy that you then have to spend the money and sell your house to support your medical treatment. And uh, this happens in many, many countries. Uh, there is an ancient uh, Japanese tradition. Uh, it was the Yama, the grandmother uh, throwing mountain in the sense of the mountain where you throw the grandmother. Uh, so some people, they didn't want to be a bother. So they'd ask the younger family members, please take me to the mountain and let me die there. Uh, we find this in some indigenous groups around the world as well. Uh, if you've ever been to graveyards, and uh, sadly probably many of you have, think about it, is that where you want to spend your life after death? I certainly don't want to be in a stone grave. Okay. I prefer to be turned into a tree or given eaten by the fish. It's maybe much nicer for me. But our tradition of death culture is uh, interesting in that regard as well, because you keep on spending money. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Taiwan, but uh, in Japan, I, I know that if you don't pay your yearly fee to the temple, they will uh, dig up your, <laughs> take your little urn of bones and ashes and put it into the common grave, and then you give up the land and plot. But you spend a lot of money. There are some interesting movies on this. Uh, in New Zealand, in the case of my parents, you buy uh, uh, maybe a, a plot for life, and you only pay once, like $1,000, and it's for the rest of perpetuity, for as long as the civilization will be concerned about that graveyard, and uh, very economical. So maybe you have a marriages in in New Zealand or Australia, maybe you can have funerals and graveyards here too. It would save you a lot of money. But this is a part of the dying process as well. So informed choice is not just on the process of uh, what we fear with our physical death, but also for our, in a communitarian sense, for the way that we pass on. 
the hesitant introduction of patient-centered decision-making in paternalistic societies is related more to the structure of family-oriented society than to any difference in an individual's attitude between sovereign societies. We can see contrasts with some countries having decriminalized euthanasia, such as the Netherlands. Others continue to punish removal of medical technology from a patient that might hasten the end of life. This is really a great uh, extreme, even in the same cultural areas, such as in Europe. There are also theories of ethics uh, in the West, as well as in the East, based on community, which argue that individuality, individuality, autonomy, or the rights of a person are not suited to the community structure of society. Communitarians argue that societies need a commitment to general welfare and common purpose. And this protects their members against the abuses of individualism, which could be equated with a selfish pursuit of liberty. The term bioethics has had the effect of stimulating cultures around the world to think about relationships between patient and practitioner, as well as between the public and the government. The development of the Asian Bioethics Association in 1995 is one attempt to break with the domination of US bioethics and to revisit back to our communities. Organ donation is an act of beneficence, the love of life. Old ethics and communitarian tradition apply to new technologies. But there are, it's a paradox because high rates in the United States, despite it being individualistic in some measures, why should you give your organs to other people that in your normal life you didn't really care too much about? Well, it seems like that. Of course, people in every society do. But if we have an image of an individualistic society of informed choice, why would you help others? This, by the way, is a, a Japanese angel. Uh, the way they were promoting organ transplants in the 1990s uh, uh, was through this image. She had a cosmetic surgery, like uh, many uh, people before. Concepts even of holiness associated with whiteness, a whole set of ethical issues associated with that. And ironically, the communitarian cultures in Asia, why would they use a uh, European injury. It's sort of strange. The introduction of Western medicine uh, has seen uh, also an influx of Western religion, philosophy, and etiquette in every society in the world, including through many indigenous cultures. As cultures evolve, it becomes impossible to separate which aspects were introduced from which sources at which time. Within a few decades, a culture may see something as unique to its own tradition even though it was imported. Even the concept of having a written text can be a cultural import in some Asian countries. Although ancient Japanese and Chinese books date back more than 1,300 years, and the legal systems were established at earlier times, the westernization of Asia led to European-style laws being introduced. This affects the types of laws and guidelines that govern medical practice. I think the concept of natural death is mixed in Japan, as it is in other countries. We saw that mentioned. Indigenous knowledge systems I think are critical, and we have to ensure they survive, and the wisdom is applied in many areas. They often use the informed consent and informed choice model. So decolonized knowledge is valued, I think, in all knowledge and wisdom traditions. How do we shape a healthy spirituality for humankind? How do we rejoice in diversity and pluralism? So these are often, often based on choice. But it was the Western medicine introduced with the concept of paternalism in medicine. This, I think, is uh, interesting. If we have a traditional medicine and a med medical practitioner being so common that every family may have somebody gathering plants and animals and treating ailments, treating pain. Then you move to a professional hierarchy where you have a person in the knowledge of how who will then make decisions for you and be the only source of that scientific knowledge. Ironically, it may be that it was the West 
the colonialism that led to a loss of choice, if you can follow the rationale that I'm talking about. I think this is an interesting topic because we have to look further back and see that actually traditional knowledge may have been more egalitarian, more uh, around with different people taking part. But the professionalization of knowledge of a medicine uh, did this lead to a lack of informed choice. And when uh, hospitalization and death becomes a business, when it becomes a business that you earn money from dying, then you want to control that, that flow. So this, I think, is interesting in terms of the movement of palliative care, that we're going back to traditional roots and people died at home. They had control and choice over their dying process more than giving up that control to people who would uh, take it away. I have several, uh, I want to spend a few minutes on Japan since I uh, know more about that culture. Uh, I think Japan has uh, with a history that goes back at least three millennia and a culture that shows great respect for aged persons. So one would expect to treat the elderly well when they are dying. The problem in Japan for current end of life care is not so much a lack of resources or attention, but too much attention to the goal of sustaining life. Without enough attention being given to the wishes of the patient as a person. Informed consent is generally accepted. The biopic is part of the transition that's transforming Japanese society from a paternalistic to a more individualistic one. Now the patient as a person, for those of you who are a bit uh, older, you may know a book in 1970 written by a man called Paul Ramsey, who was one of the fathers of the United States biopics. That book is quite good, The Patient as a Person. Okay, and I would suggest, even though that book is uh, 47 years old, it's still maybe useful to see the thinking at that time in terms of uh, informed choice. Like all countries and populations, it's a bit more complicated. Since the Meiji Restoration in the 19th century in Japan, the doors of Japan have been opened to all countries. The samurai spirit that promoted informed choice for samurai, acting on behalf of both individuals and their rulers to follow an honor code, was downplayed. It became illegal to settle a dispute by a samurai duel, uh, by you know, fighting. Uh, and the uh, samurai idea was uh, diminished. Uh, since the 1970s, people have become more conscious of their right to informed consent which could be attributed to the importation of civil rights debates that occurred in the United States and Japan in the 1960s. And Rito Kimura was one of the leading figures in this introducing, introduction of uh, Western bioethics to Asia. Uh, Article 13 of the Japanese Constitution guarantees each adult's individual right to self-determination. So there's a literature also on self-determination uh, which parallels the literature of informed choice. This has been interpreted by the courts to include the right to refuse life-sustaining care and medical intervention, including refusal of blood transfusion by adults. However, however, in general practice, this is so often ignored, and only in the past few years have courts applied that concepts to patients' decision-making. Uh, in the 19th century, some philosophers such as uh, Nakai Shoman introduced concepts of human rights, he reinterpreted Confucianism by injecting concepts of popular sovereignty and democratic equality and provided an internal tradition of human rights. I would place the origin of informed choice with the older samurai tradition, however, which includes the control of when one will die and the dignity of honorable suicide choices. In addition, the concept of informed consent is seen in the writings of Hanako Seishu on breast cancer from the 19th century. But very interesting case. You've probably heard of, we have a colleague from India. Have you heard of the uh, gurus from India? One of the great uh, feats of gurus is control of their respiration. I mean, nowadays, mindfulness and meditation are quite popular. Yeah, have, I don't know if some of you have used it. Yoga or meditation, mindfulness is enhancing educational outcomes. 
We've had some people do courses. So interestingly, the control of respiration. Ancient samurais also used this. And you can see, see some documented accounts of samurai controlling respiration when they would like to die. So the, the great control of your mind to decide when to die, not by physical means, but by respiratory control to eventually take yourself down and decide. It's an interesting issue of informed choice. It's another issue, I think, of research. There's another interesting thing that uh, you may know. There's statistically a significant association uh, of people dying uh, when their partner dies. Yeah? And there's a, they die of a broken heart emotionally, but they die of a broken heart physically. And there's been a number of studies which have shown this. Yeah? So it actually is a medically, in a sense, and scientifically validated there is an association. So if you've lived together for a long time with one person, when your partner dies, it's very likely uh, you may go quite soon after. Interesting. Interesting. So these are interesting aspects of the extent of choice that we make and the role of choice in the actual, even the physical uh, control. Um, coming back to laws in Japan and the, in this case study in a sense, the Japan Society for Death with Dignity was established in 1976 and after failing to introduce a law on the withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy, they promoted the use of living wills. But less than 1% of people will die with some form of advance directive in Japan. I think it uh, hasn't increased much. There is no case of a doctor being sued in the courts for following the living will. It is a case where doctors and families together may disagree with the living will. Members of the society seldom report a case where a physician does not respect the living will. <coughs> public opinion surveys find strong public support for the concept of death with dignity. Although in the 1995 survey, which is 22 years ago, 80% of persons said they were aware of living wills, 88% said they would give a lot of leeway to surrogates to override the decision. The main reasons given were that it's difficult to talk about death and dying in a family, trust in their families, and it was difficult to imagine the future. However, research indicates that people in East Asian cultures do not want to talk freely about death inside their family and few have considered preparing advanced directives. Uh, and uh, my dear uh, colleague, uh, he's in the, who's, uh, he's sitting there, we studied uh, together, and I uh, want to talk a bit further later about some research on the comparisons with Taiwan, New Zealand, and Japan. Physicians, however, in these surveys are more supportive of attempting life-sustaining treatment. The surveys show that people do want to die with dignity, but that there are difficulties in expressing these views to those around them. More importantly, physicians usually lack the communication skills to talk about options with patients, so that they may decide to start and continue life-sustaining treatment rather than question whether the patients actually want it. The views of university physicians caring for adult patients in academic medical centers concerning advanced directives were surveyed in 1996. Almost all respondents chose the option of having the doctor and family decide on treatment for demented patients together. This was part of a six-country study uh, that I conducted. The persons chosen to discuss the treatment with consisted of a mixture of relatives and those caring for the patient and those in the family who had the best ability to decide. The respondents said that the most important factor in making the decision was what's considered best for the patient, followed by the family's will. Now, it may be interesting if you repeat the studies today, you'll find many of the similar reasoning. And on the previous slide, it talked about, uh, don't want to talk about death. And that was the same as our previous presentation. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Death is an evil, we don't want to talk about it. Yes? Uh, yet, if we want informed choice, we do. 
and maybe in the past we did. So it's interesting where this stage in our human history came. Was it a stage that uh, when death was very common, yeah, a couple hundred years ago where infectious diseases were so common, did we talk about death more than we do in, this, uh, in the 20th century? Age is also a factor in the acceptance of withdrawal of aggressive treatment and discussions that patients will have with their family. However, many hospitals may seek to reap profits by having old persons in their intensive care units, even after death. Not accepting brain death as a criteria means that extra days or weeks of intensive care payments can be received by the hospital. There is little data on this practice because most hospitals do not like to publicize such a disrespectful act. Doing so would upset the families and lead to loss of revenue. However, there is still a tendency to be less aggressive in treatment the older a person is, which is consistent with the older tradition that aged persons should not be a burden on the family when their time is up. Now, I certainly remember when I first came to Taiwan uh, to this university 20 years ago, the issues uh, at that time uh, were uh, very much this medicalization and uh, over-medicalization of treatment of uh, dying persons. Um, and I still believe that uh, this actually slightly accusationary language is true in many countries. But many hospitals are making money by keeping people in hospital and using many expensive tests on old persons, uh, even if the National Health Service pays for it, it's still um, um, uh, somebody is paying. You are actually paying for it. It is disrespectful. Mere life prolonging treatment for terminally ill patients should be reconsidered in terms of respect for human dignity, as well as the psychological burden on the family in question. For example, CPR for cardiac arrest or respiratory cessation of terminal patients often results in their lengthening of the patient's suffering. The bioethics debate has been a catalyst required to transform Japan and Taiwan and some other cases from a paternalistic democracy into one in which the individual has a greater choice in healthcare decisions. Uh, if we compare to 20 or 30 years ago when we had these discussions, uh, we can see a transition. Professional hierarchies are also changing over time. Differences in different ethnic groups, beyond personality types, or wide gaps between countries. Hierarchies exist everywhere. Uh, different goals of the encounter or relationship. Uh, and how do they relate to the hierarchy of knowledge in both traditional Western systems? In fact, it may be linked to this hierarchy of knowledge. Um, if you're interested in the history and philosophy of science, for example, you may know that about 160 years ago, the movement that scientists would become very elite in society, replacing the priests who were formerly the source of great knowledge and power. So you had the priests of creation now became the scientists who were then became very elevated. But the medical profession has always been part of this elite. Yeah? Uh, we can see through medical schools the last couple of millennia. So this hierarchy of knowledge and power. People of any country may resist the rapid change in globalization of their ethics, ideals and paradigms because ethnic and national identities may be changed or lost, especially in countries with a long history of culture. Part of social development includes importing and developing ethical approaches that can be debated, but a more important part is involving the public in discussion and development of bioethics policy that takes into account the country's diverse ethical traditions. We have to balance ideals. So these ideals, doing good is not doing harm, individual autonomy, justice to all. We'll learn more about this as we have some more bioethics lectures uh, later. There's a long heritage seen in choices that people make. We see it in biology, medicine, social systems, and religion. So you can see the democratization of medicine, of religion, of government, of societies, 
these little trends uh, that have occurred. I want to talk a little about Tao. Uh, one of the interesting, uh, I think, uh, results from the survey, in fact, of Professor Dina, who's here, is uh, asking seniors about the views of end of life care in Taiwan, Japan, and New Zealand. It revealed these types of images found in three cultures, and you can read about it more in a number of papers, uh, for example. But the idea of the flow of Tao that you can let life in naturally when your time is right. So Taoism has this idea that in Western thought we have the idea too. Natural is better. Every culture around the world has it. So every culture in the world may be Taoist, I guess. This is a conclusion. Or maybe it was the religions which discovered this idea of thinking that was existing before in terms of the human relationships to nature and technology that we would use interventions in these processes uh, appropriately. Cultural homogeneity is an illusion. So we may believe that the culture of one group is homogenous. Uh, genes, beliefs, ethos, and identity. The concept of control in nature and natural processes varies between people even within the modern culture that attempts to control nature. Uh, and you can see this at the end of life. And you can see it in the writings of the end of life for the last 3,000 years. You can see people writing about the end of life gear. Some of you may have heard of the Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath, like some other medical oaths, it is said, the doctor will not give any poison to the patient in the act of euthanasia. This was a very basic division between uh, medical doctors that if you wanted to get an end of life care uh, that would not involve poison, then you would go to a doctor who follows the Hippocratic tradition or another tradition that claims they don't give poison. But if you wanted to hasten your death, then maybe you go to take uh, certain herbal remedies or other poisons and they will hasten your death. Um, so, that, we have that division still today. There are often significant minorities that are neglected in discussions of community or nation. Social science shows it's no predictor of one person's ethical views. We need a case-by-case -case ethics and good communication. So in this room, the same as in any other room, there will be people who would say, I don't want to be intubated. I don't want uh, aggressive treatment. And there will be other people who say, I do want it. Okay. Same division. We can't predict based on which country you're from or which religion. So even within a particular indigenous group showing some common beliefs in ontology, people will make different ethical choices. But the framework for empowerment of such choices and the unit of moral decision making is important. So some challenges, uh, what are some I think, challenges that we have? How can so-called universal principles of bioethics be applied and useful to people in a wide range of cultures as they face challenges of new technology and globalization? Can we see the origins of bioethics in all cultures as we examine the universal diversity of approaches to common questions of life? Is there universal ethics? Uh, I think there's universal diversity of ethics, and there may be common ways of thinking. But you have a country such as the Netherlands, where two or three percent of people die through an injection from the doctor. Thank you, doctor. And we have a neighboring country where it's a crime for the doctor to do so. But there's still Europe. Okay? And uh, the same in other parts of the world as well. So we do have this uh, division. I think we have a right to education of all traditions of knowledge, which will lead us to education as empowerment. Education will lead us to choice. Uh, if you wish to learn more about American University of Sovereign Nations, uh, some of the professors in this room 
uh, I hope in, in this endeavor to try and think about educational traditions, then please uh, join us. Professor Sai, Professor Sonato, Professor Chen, Professor Hu, uh, some of the faculty, Professor Jopi. So these are uh, people working. We're trying to create different ways of learning knowledge to think about this choice. We should have choice in education as well. If we have choice in education, we can learn about the traditions of India or Thailand or Nepal or Japan or the United States or Taiwan, whatever we'd like to learn about. We don't need to follow one textbook. There are many uh, cross-cultural materials available on the web that is open source. Uh, some of them are available in Word format or PowerPoints, so you can download and you can change it according to what you'd like. It's available in different languages. So you can f teach what's appropriate to your culture, but there are resources where you can start. Um, uh, so this is a, a journal as well. So if you are interested, please uh, visit. There are thousands of papers, and I mean thousands of papers on Asian bioethics. There are around 2,000 papers uh, openly accessible for the last uh, uh, 27 years. So trying to create a forum so we can discuss together the uh, choices that people make. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you're welcome to take a copy of the slides. Thank you. Yes, I have a question. Uh, Professor Sai, for Professor Mason. Okay. If there's no question, we'll thank Professor Mason. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.